Hello again, everybody. This is Joe Larson, and you're watching the Five Off, Five On Racing Show. Welcome. Welcome to another evening of race talk. We got a lot planned for today. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a father who kind of took funds from his company, was found guilty, so his son could race. We'll talk about that later. We'll have some banquet etiquette chat, as we always do this time of year. Also, gonna talk about the. Uh, 2018 clash at Daytona, who's in and how they got in. We're going to talk about some news at the Richard Petty Motorsports Camp. Big news on, on, on one side and some really good news on the other side. We'll talk about National Wheel and Modified Tour and the Touring Banquet. We have some champion photos to show everybody and some tour news that's going on. And we're also, as we always do in the offseason uh, this year, we're going to where are they now? So tonight, we're going to talk about Buck Baker. Buck Baker, NASCAR Grand National Champion, who was born March 4th, 2019, and unfortunately passed away of natural causes in April of 2002. He was born Elsie Wiley Baker in Richburg, South Carolina. He was, he first raced in 1939, running some of the local dirt tracks, such as Greenville, uh, Pickens Speedway in South Carolina. But he began racing in what was known then as the Grand National Series uh, in 1949, with his first victory coming at the Columbia Speedway in South Carolina. Baker's career spanned 26 years, retiring in uh, 1976 after the then named National 500, which was held at the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Baker won two championships. He had 46 wins and 45 poles in the Grand National Division, now known as the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series. Controversy had, did follow Baker, although by none of his own doing. He finished second and was credited with a win, a race clearly won by NASCAR's first and only African-American at the time, driver Wendell Scott. NASCAR later reversed their decision, but Scott never received the trophy for that race, and he was never credited officially with that win. In 1976, Baker opened the Buck Baker Racing School, a school which saw future champions Jeff Gordon drive his first stock car, as well as Tony Stewart. Buck's son, Buddy Baker, an announcer in the racing broadcast today, um, and also a Monster Energy NASCAR Cup veteran taught at the school along with Buck's daughter, Susie Baker. Inaugurated into the National Motorsports Press Hall of Fame in 1982, the International Motorsports Hall of Fame in 1990. He was the Motorsports Hall of Fame of America inductee in 1998, and he was named one of NASCAR's greatest drivers, the top 50 greatest drivers, also in 1998, and then inducted to the, the Shrine of Auto Racing Hall of Fames, the NASCAR Hall of Fame, located in Charlotte, North Carolina, in 2013. But he still holds the record for winning the 1980 Daytona 500 at a record speed of 177.602 miles an hour basically a caution free race to be able to get those kind of uh, speeds going up nobody's come close because cautions in today breed cautions and you're just not going to get those those kind of speeds especially with restrictor plate racing baker was monster energy nascar cup champion in 56 and 57 the first cup driver to win the title two years in a row and after his second and Lee Petty did it two years in a row, and he did that in 58 and 59. Buck Baker's school still operates as the Buck Baker Seat Time Driving School, where you could go and get an experience in driving laps on a speedway. It's a, it's a fun thing, and I believe it's held only at the Bristol Motor Speedway in Bristol, Tennessee, and the Atlanta Motor Speedway in Atlanta. Buck Baker, former champion, 
Uh, one of those guys that paved the way for everybody else, a tough, rugged competitor who uh, back, you know, when you look back in those days, they were tough guys. They, they were really tough guys, muscling these cars around racetracks with no power steering. And in the early 50s and mid 50s, these cars were basically stock components off a showroom floor with a roll cage put in it. They rolled down the, the, the windows and went racing. They taped up the headlights and things of that nature. And some drivers actually drove their race cars to some of the local tracks. And it was just a, an era in racing that could have won anyway, but thanks to the efforts of Big Bill France and, and his team, they kept racing going and, and put legitimacy into racing because up until then, many of the drivers who competed in the racing prior to the NASCAR inauguration uh, would race these races, pay entry fees, and then at the end of the race, they go to collect their money and the promoters went home. So Buck Baker, one of the pioneers in our sport. Our next driver that we're going to take a look back on is Jeff Fuller. Jeff Fuller, born in 1962 in Auburn, Massachusetts. He was a Whalen modified tour driver from 1985 to 2003. He ran one race in 2008 and ran and raced in the Whalen Southern Modified Tour in 2011 for one race as well. As well. Uh, Fuller had 240 starts in the Modified Series with 31 wins and 16 poles in a championship in 1992. Uh, with eight victories, uh, I'm sorry, six victories. The year prior, 1991, Fuller had seven wins, and he was the man to beat almost each and every week. Fuller was in the K&N Pro Series, and he raced six events over five seasons, uh, starting in 1988 with one victory in 1996. In 1992, Fuller drove one race uh, before moving to the the series in 1995 full time, racing in the series paid for seven, raced in the series. I'm sorry for 17 seasons with 188 starts, and that would be the Xfinity series, which is was then called the Nationwide Series. He had that for 17 seasons, and he had one victory, which was in 1996. In 1995, Fuller finished 10th in the point standings. His best year ever in the point standings in the Xfinity series. Full also raced five cup races starting in 1999, uh, one in each season, one in 2000, 04, 05, and 2010. He moved to North Carolina to chase his dream, and after his retirement from racing, Fuller involved himself with an organization called BRAKES, B-R-A-K-E-S, which is an acronym for Be Responsible and Keep Everyone Safe. It was, it's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to prevent injuries and to save lives by training people how to avoid accidents. They educate teenage drivers and their parents about the importance of safe and responsible driving. This driver training teaches drivers how to avoid collisions, how, steering control, uh, where to brake, how to brake, and other vehicular related accident avoidance measures. Fuller is one of the instructors in this series. Uh, Jeff is the brother of the 1993 Will and Modify Tour, Rick Fuller. And a crash at Kentucky, uh, I watched a video of it, unfortunately we can't use it, I watched a video of, of this wreck, and it was to avoid Jason Leffler, and it was, I'd have to say, one of the hardest hits that I've ever seen a race car go into the wall. Although it was on the passenger side, the driver's side body ripped off from the impact. Fuller had to be cut from the car and taken to the infield care center and then taken to a local hospital. When all the checking on him was done, he only suffered a broken wrist. And, and, I, and, and I had the opportunity for a season, I guess, when he was on and off with the tour, to, to meet uh, Jeff Fuller. And, and I can remember as a young person, when they came to Long Island, you know, it was the Fuller brothers coming to Long Island. And, and he had left the series and I was still kind of fairly new, it was maybe my second year, and one of the things that I was responsible for as a race director was to hold the rookie meeting. In other words, I had to bring the rookies into the hauler 
and sit down and talk about what we expect from them, how they should race, what they should do, and we'd bring in an experienced driver to talk to them. And I'd go up and, and find a driver, maybe a, a past champion that wasn't busy or somebody who's won there. So a, a quick story, we go to Nazareth, and, uh, and I go to get Jeff Fuller, who, who's Ricky's uh, you know, brother. Uh, I go to get Ricky Fuller, who's Jeff's brother, <laughs> excuse me. And, and I call them by the wrong name, like I just did. And, and a, a little quote that sticks in my head all year, you know, Rick Fuller said, I'm not Jeff, I'm Rick taller than he is and better looking. Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know if it's a better looking, but he is taller. But uh, Jeff Fuller, uh, one of those guys in the Modified Tour who, who moved up the ranks. He, he moved up the ranks into the Xfinity Series, then Nationwide Series, had a couple of cup races. I'm sure they were events where either the Modifieds were there or the k and Pro Series was there or the Xfinity was there. And um, you know, from the, from the looks of it and from the research I did, it wasn't like he was a start in park because they didn't have too many of those and back in those days. You had to make the show. You had to make the race. And, uh, and he did. So uh, Jeff Fuller stepped down from racing and he's helping young people and, and their families teach them how to drive uh, and avoid crashes and, and be safe, and, and that's down in, in North Carolina. So um, where are they now? And it's, it's interesting things that you find out in, in doing research for this. And some things you could talk about and some things you can't, but uh, it's, it's a eye-opening education into what our former race cars did race car drivers, I should say, but you know and when you look at that, look back in the old days of racing, and you, you look back in the, in the like the, let's say the modified series, when you have 50 cars show up and they're starting 28, and now you have you know maybe 32 cars showing up and this and they're starting 36. When I get in full fields in, in the series and and the Cup series as well, but back in those days, back in Buck Baker's days. You, it, it wouldn't be crazy to have 70 cars show up for an event. And then most of them in the early days, if you showed up, you started. And racing today is so, so much different than it was years ago. And most of the drivers back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not only did they drive them, but when they wrecked them, they fixed them. And now there's big shops and all these kind of places, and basically the, the driver takes his helmet off and his Hans device and his suit and switches into G's and a t-shirt and it blends into the crowd. Back then they couldn't do that. Back then they were well known. And they didn't even have fire suits, but they were well known uh, among the racing ranks. So uh, where are they now? A fun segment. Next week's Where Are They Now will be, um, and it will be Rick Fuller in the Modifieds and uh, I'm not sure who we're going to have in the Cup Series, but it'll be the Cup Series. And if there's anybody you want to hear about on the 505 on racing show just send me a, a private message through social media and we're more than happy to uh, accommodate you as soon as we can and anyway, we're going to take a break and when we come back we're going to talk about the nascar touring banquet that was held in charlotte north carolina on a return and look at some of the champion photos when we come back Hey, hey, what's set up? Oh, I said I was going to say what's up for some reason. Hey, hey we're, we're set, set it up. up, and you're watching the Enradio TV Network.
Village Music Shop of Master. 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems and accessories. It's Village Music Shop, 1495 Montauk Highway in Mastic. Call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. Hi there, this is Buddy from Less Than Jake, and you are listening to In Radio TV. You're probably watching it, too. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. All right. Hey, just before I get into uh, some of the Torrent Series Banquet information, uh, remember to go into our, our site, in radio.com, 5051 Racing Show. Uh, we constantly and continuously have contests there uh, for concert tickets or what have you. So check it out. Go in, look, register. If there's something that you see that you want to do and you want to enter that contest, feel free to do so. I know uh, many people have taken advantage of that, but uh, I've been kind of lax in telling you about that. But in radio.com, check it out and go uh, look at our contest. Anyway, the NASCAR touring series held its annual banquet uh, this past weekend in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was a typical banquet. I, I didn't attend. I haven't been to one of those in a, in a couple of years. And, and this is a touring banquet. This is all the touring series other than the top three, which is, you know, the Monster Energy Cup and the uh, Xfinity and the Camp World Truck Series. You know, this is the, the NASCAR Wheel and Modify Tour. Um, the the uh, what do they call that? The uh, Mexico Series, the Kane and Pro Series, uh, the Wheel and Euro Series, the Pinty Series up in uh, Canada, and uh, the Kane and Pro Series West. And and what they did is they have a banquet, just like the Cup banquet was held in Vegas. And this year they also, and they've done this in the past, is the NASCAR, NASCAR Wheel and All American Series champion Lee Pulliam was also uh, giving his hardware, software, the ring. And not only was he, but many of the other NASCAR Whale and All-American Series champions as well were there from across the country. So Lee Pulliam uh, was hobnobbing with the, with the higher echelon in, in NASCAR race. And I'll tell you what, I think it's gonna be uh, very soon when you see uh, Lee Pulliam in a touring series somewhere, probably in a K&N series car. Anyway, Doug Kobe, NASCAR Wheel and Modified five-time champion, received his ring and uh, was honored with his awards in front of the touring banquet uh, guest. Uh, Doug Kobe, uh, driver for Mike Smiglio Racing, uh, MS3 Racing, because it's Mike Smiglio the third. And, and Mike, He's been involved with this sport for quite some time and always, always, always has competitive race cars. So uh, I, I congratulate the team as I did when they ended the season at Thompson Motorsports Park in Connecticut. But, uh, you know, Doug Colby's one of those guys that anytime I'm walking around the racetrack somewhere, Doug is more than happy to talk to me. And he's a well spoken individual. And uh, I wish him well in 2018. Uh, Mexico's uh, Abraham Calderon. He was the NASCAR Peak Mexico Series champion, and there he is uh, showing off his trophy and his championship ring. And it's good to see, you know, when you look at that NASCAR's expanding uh, into south of the border and also north of the border here in, in North America. And, uh, and the logistics, I gotta say, to get these guys and these teams and their race cars to Charlotte for the banquet, I think it's just amazing. Harrison Burton, Harrison uh, Burton was the K&N Pro Series East champion. Uh, Harrison uh, been running a K&N Pro Series East uh, series uh, in, in, a, in a manner where consistency wins championships, as you can see from the picture, a, a young gentleman. And a lot of people make fun of the K&N series and they you know, call it the the K K&N meaning kids and nephews of 
the top series. And, and that's really not so much the truth. The K&M Pro Series East and West has become a development program. And why not develop your drivers in a series like that, guys and gals who didn't have the opportunity to go into NASCAR's diversity programs and earn their way into a series. But the k and Pro Series East used to be the old Bush North uh, series when we had the Bush Series before it was nationwide. And it was, was kind of like the modified tour back then. It was a bunch of local guys from the Northeast who just wanted to go race and they didn't want to race open wheel cars or they came out of late models at their local racetrack and won racing in the k and n k and n Filters has been a, a proud partner of NASCAR for many, many years. Now we have Aaron Day, uh, the NASCAR Whalen Euro Series champion. And, and, and in the Euro Series is raced all over Europe. It's, it's, I'm going to say it's almost like a Formula One because they're in different countries uh, racing. And so Alan Day, uh, uh, a champion in that series. And, and that had to be a logistical uh, nightmare. I'm sure a, if it wasn't for NASCAR's help, uh, their team and their equipment would not have made it to Charlotte because that's got to be an expensive trip. And, and somebody had said to me, you don't really think they bring that car from Europe. They probably take one that the body matches and wrap it with his decals. You know, if that's what they do, we would do. But you know what? I don't think that's what they do. I really don't. So congratulations to Alan Day on his championship. In the NASCAR Pinty Series, uh, Alex Lamb was the champion there. Uh, the Pinty Series is up in Canada. Uh, was we Pinty with a, a new sponsor. It was the Canadian Tire Series a deal for many, many years now, the Pinty Series. I had the opportunity to, to go up to Canada while I was with NASCAR and uh, see how they do it up there. And I'll tell you what, once you get to the racetrack, it's a racetrack. They all look the same. There's people in the stands. There's pavement. There's race cars, and it's loud, and there's good racing. So uh, NASCAR continuing its efforts to uh, expand their brand uh, globally. In the k and Pro Series West, which used to be years ago, the old Winston West Series, uh, Todd Gilliland was the champion there. Back-to-back -back championships for uh, Todd. And you might see there that the k and Pro Series East logo is behind him. That is because he uh, did some double duty. And uh, that's the, the shot that NASCAR has on file for him. So uh, Todd, uh, young, young gentleman, uh, looks to make it up uh, the ranks in the years. And, and I'll tell you what, when you, know, you win these championships in a k and Pro Series, whether it's East or West, you know, your chances to moving up to, to truck or Xfinity are far greater, and, and, and I, I don't believe I'm saying this, but far greater than someone who's running open wheel. And when you think about that, it's a whole different experience. As we, we recall, we had a NASCAR wheel and All-American Series modified driver and an occasional tour racer. Um, C.J. Lehman was here, and, and he started in, in other than go karts, but he started in full fended cars at his local racetrack here on Long Island. And he even said that it was a, the learning curve was you couldn't lean on somebody because the, there's the wheels hanging right out. You you tear right front off if you lean into them a little too hard, a little too too aggressive. And so these guys that are in that k and Pro Series have, in my opinion, a better opportunity to move up the ranks and, and get into the uh, uh, other series. So congratulations to all the champs. But I have one more that I want to talk about, and that's uh, the champion car owner, which is usually the car owner whose driver finishes in first place well, for the first time in NASCAR history. That did not happen. Long Island's Eddie and Connie Partridge uh, were the winners there with their driver, most of the time Ryan Priest, who had to miss a couple events due to his Xfinity obligations and also to get married. Eddie, being a true competitor, and his, along with his wife Connie, put somebody else in the car for those events that Ryan could not make. And when the final points tally was made for the owner points, Eddie and Connie Partridge were the owner's champion. So that's a picture of uh, Eddie, Connie, and Ryan Priest with the crew in the background with the owner's trophy and their car that they used, the number six car that they used. 
uh, in route to that championship. So, so congratulations to Eddie and Connie Parchers, who also are the owners and promoters of Long Island's Riverhead Raceway. Uh, wish Eddie and Connie luck in 2018. And when Ryan Priest moving up to Xfinity, I wish him a lot of luck as well. And speaking of the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour, NASCAR and Wheel and Engineering announced a multi-year extension to continue its entitlement sponsorship of the NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour and the NASCAR Wheel and Euro Series through 2024. Uh, Wheel and a NASCAR partner for over 10 years is deeply connected to many levels of the sport. Uh, Wayland Engineering uh, supplies emergency lighting not only to racetracks, but to many of the police departments, fire departments, emergency vehicles, tow trucks, ambulances, uh, not only throughout the country, but throughout the world. Uh, Wayland Engineering started up in a little garage up in Connecticut many years ago, just in the shadows of the new London Waterford Speed Bowl. And uh, with, with, with Whalen uh, being involved so heavily, um, the Whalen Modified Tour, they're involved with a series on the Modifieds, which is NASCAR's oldest division of race cars, it's dating back to the Daytona Beach Race in 1948. Now, if you look back on the cars that were on the beach in 1948, they do not look like modifieds of today. But they were called modifieds because the other series was strictly stock. They were called modifieds because you went to your local car dealer, you got a car, whether they gave it to you, you borrowed it, you paid for it, however that worked, and you were allowed to modify it in some way. And that's why they were called modifieds. Well, in 1949, NASCAR went a different route, still had the modified series, but they kept the strictly stocks and changed them to Grand Nationals. So uh, when you look and they say, hey, well, modifieds, what's he talking about? They don't look like modifieds. No, they don't. But as modifieds progressed along the way, um, they became cars where they were built in backyards, garages attached to your house, garages in your backyard or some farm somewhere, and they were they took parts and they put them together and they modified them. And that's why they were called modifieds. A, a little simple fact that a lot of people don't know, don't appreciate, <laughs> and, I, and I really wish they'd go back to that. But I understand why they haven't, because it, it becomes a technical nightmare for NASCAR and its officials. They want everything to be the same and they want body measurements to be the same. They want the engines to be the same, the drivetrain to be the same, and everything to be the same. Uh, up to like where you could even sit in your race car. And, and that's good for the most part because you have you know, some safety issues you want to deal with. But think about, think about when you were a kid and some of you guys that watch and listen are, are kids already. You know, they don't know what it was like years ago. But you'd go out to practice day where they just come practice or you come out to open a night where the cars aren't lettered and painted yet. You were able to tell whose car was who because they were all distinct and they looked different. You'd be hard pressed to do that today. So anyway, welcome Wheeling for signing on. And, and, and I believe that that title sponsorship uh, will go through 2024 with the Modified Tour and the Euro Series. So that's, that's another you know seven seasons of, of racing or, or six seasons. So uh, thank you, Whelan. And I know Phil Kerr is the president uh, motorsports marketing uh, at Wheeling Engineering um, has a lot to do with that and I know Phil's behind the scenes um, battling with the NASCAR brass to get TV for these series and for these uh, race cars and, and for the sponsors of these guys as well so thank you Phil thank you Wheeling it's uh, it's just just a beautiful thing what goes on there anyway we're gonna take a break when we come back we're gonna share some NASCAR news with you, some of the stuff that's going on, uh, the clash at the Daytona, how that's going to, who's going to be in it, and uh, more racing talk when we come back. Hi, I'm Remington. I'm Emerson. And I'm Sebastian. We're Palais Royale, and you're watching in Radio TV.
The world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, in Radio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is in Radio.com. Hey, this is Chris Lester Jake, and if in Ravio.com spots you at an event wearing this bracelet, they will give you $100. Village Music Shop of Master, 1 800 Hey Dude, your full service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems, and accessories. It's Village Music Shop. 1495 Montauk Highway in Mastiff. Call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. Hi, this is Mike Jarecki from My Race News and you're watching the Enravio TV Network. Welcome back, everybody. I, I, you know, the, the clash at Daytona. It's, to me, one of the most exciting races of all the Speed Week at the Daytona International Speedway. And I've been, been to the clash many, many times. It's been called many, many things over the years. And its format has changed over and over again uh, in efforts to make it better. So 20 drivers eligible for the 2018 Clash at the Daytona, a 75-lap exhibition race. And basically, to be eligible for the Clash, you had to have a pole in the previous season. So the 14 pole winners for 2017 were Ryan Blaney, Kurt Busch, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Chase Elliott, Denny Hamlin, Kevin Harvick, Eric Jones, Matt Kenseth, Brad Keselowski, Kyle Larson, Joey Logano, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., and Martin Truex Jr. Also, former Daytona pole winners who ran in 2017 are also eligible, such as Austin Dillon, Jimmy Johnson, and Danica Patrick. Three playoff drivers are selected, Casey Kane, Jamie McMurray, and Ryan Newman. Um, with Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Matt Kenseth, who uh, retired, uh, they are not expected to compete. However, Danica Patrick, her plans for the clash are not confirmed as of yet. She is still trying to work a deal to get a car for Speed Weeks and not only race the clash, but also race in the Daytona 500 as well. Uh, as we talked earlier in the year, um, Danica is hoping to run the Daytona 500 and the Indy 500, so she's working on that. Uh, as we speak, going to try to get a team to give her equipment, but I'm sure what has to come with that is some big sponsorship money, because to run Daytona is a lot, a lot of money, and it's probably the most expensive race to field a car in, as you're there more than a week, and you have the clash, you have pole day qualifying, then it's practice the uh, uh, rest of the week, and then you have the dual 150s on Thursday, and some more practice and all that kind of stuff going on Friday, Saturday for the cup cars, and the uh, granddaddy of all races, the Daytona 500. Also announced last week, Long Island's Freddie Kraft will be Daryl Bubba Wallace's spotter in the Monster Energy Drink NASCAR Cup Series starting at Daytona. As Freddie said, a friendship formed eight years ago when Kraft started working with 16-year-old Daryl Wallace in the K&N Pro Series each series. And I can remember one of his first events, and, and Freddie, for those who don't know, Freddie is family to me, and uh, real family, blood family. And Freddie said, this, is, this should be interesting, because as you see, there is, there's Freddie and, and, and Bubba Wallace at the Martinsville Speedway with the grandfather clock that uh, Bubba raced and won in the truck. And 
Freddie says, here I am, I have my Long Island accent, and I'm with an African-American guy from the South. He won't understand me, and I won't understand him. And eight years later, they're both moving up to the Cup Series together. And uh, I got to tell you, Richard Petty Motorsports is no secret, is one of my favorite teams in auto racing. And I've been following Richard Petty since I knew what the, a race car was on ABC's Wide World of Sports in the 60s. And whoever drove for Richard Petty, I rooted for that guy. There's uh, Freddie and I uh, interviewing Freddie. And, and, and I can remember at that interview, you know, Freddie had a choice. And he had a choice back then, back years ago, to live his dream or work for the Long Island Railroad. Now, the Long Island Railroad, for those who don't live in Long Island, um, if you can get a job with the Long Island Railroad, that's like getting a job with Grumman during World War II and during the Korean War and, unfortunately, the Vietnam War. You got a job with a company like that, the old you were set for life, he would have been set for life. But Fred turned down that opportunity and decided he wanted to chase his dreams, put all his eggs in that basket and moved to North Carolina to start a career as a spotter. And, and, I, and I teased Freddie in that interview. I said, Fred, what would you be doing if you weren't a spotter in, in NASCAR right now? And he said, I'd probably be working for the railroad. And uh, you know, this is one of those storybook deals. Here's a kid who, who came out of a local short track running around and, and Freddie was one of those guys, he was one of those kids, and, and I called them track rats. You know, they were running around underneath the bleachers, playing tag with their friends, trying to see what kind of trouble they can get in. And Freddie did that. As he got old enough to get in the pit area, he was there to quasi help his dad, because <laughs> Freddie probably knew more about working on cars than I did. There's a Bubba Wallace and myself at Freddie Kraft's wedding. And, and then Freddie tried his hand at racing in the figure eight division. Now, we're still trying to figure out how this happened. Freddie Kraft was the only figure eight driver at the local racetrack, we had race here Long Island, to earn rookie of the year two years in a row. I don't know how that happened, but, but he, if anybody can make it happen, it's, it's Freddie. Freddie realized that he wasn't really uh, meant to be as a race car driver. Uh, we made him a pit reporter, running around the racetrack when guys would pit with wrecked cars, and he'd stick a microphone in their face, and the, the fans would hear everything. It was really good, and and then he started spot. He started helping some of the lower division guys, and some mid division guys, and some modified guys, and some touring guys, and then he did some Camp and World Truck Series, Xfinity races, and now he's in the in the Cup Series. So, I, I I'm so proud of this kid, and. Uh, from his humble beginnings, living out his dream. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous. Not really, but, but I am, if you know what I mean. And to, to not only be spotting for somebody he has a relationship, but to work for Richard Petty Motorsports, it's, it's just, just incredible. Incredible news coming out, and, and who would have thought, like he said, eight years ago, when he had a chance to spot for Bubba in the Kane and Pro Series. Uh, East uh, races uh, throughout uh, the East Coast here in, in, New York, in the United States. Speaking of Richard Petty Motorsports, uh, Richard Petty will field Chevrolets in 2018's Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series and form an allegiance with Richard Childress Racing. Uh, there's Richard Petty's 2018 car all ready to go with their with their sponsor logos on it. Uh, Richard Petty Motorsports is co-owned co by Richard Petty and Angelo Merstein. And uh, you know, a lot of people say uh, he's just a figurehead there. Now Richard Petty is still involved with, with his race team. They it's not just he gave them the name and they paid him a few dollars. He has a vested interest in this. Uh, Richard Petty. Um, his allegiance or aligning with Childress for the 2018 series and the move to Chevrolet. They will share engine and chassis support and move its shop to welcome North Carolina, which is in a building right next to Richard Childress. Richard Childress and Richard Petty together, I'll tell you what, you're going to see a different Richard Petty Motorsports 
race team in 2018. And, you know, last year I, I said here on the show in the early in the 2017 season, uh, probably mid-season, right after Eric Amarola broke his back uh, driving the famed 43, and, and I said, you know, I hope they put Dow Wallace in this car because he was walking around doing nothing. And then he got the opportunity to run a couple of races and he did okay. And I said, you know, it would be so cool if they replaced him. And I said this when it was first being talked about, you're going to see Bubba Wallace in Petty's 43. Nobody believed me. Nobody, nobody was willing to accept that, that that was going to happen. And it happened. And again, I, I, I wish them well. I wish them well with this, this move to Chevy. I wish them well in their season. And it's going to be good to see Freddie on the roof with the other longtime spotters in the Cup Series. And uh, he's no stranger to this kind of pressure. And uh, he's going to make it happen. Uh, I'm looking forward to running into him at one of these events, one of these times. And we could talk some, some old stuff and things that we did at Bristol and Thompson and Stafford uh, all those years. And, and the fun we had and the stories we shared. And uh, I had the opportunity to, to live with Freddie and his family, oh, some 25, 30 years ago, and when Freddie was just a little kid. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny how you have these little, little racing bonds and, and you chat and you talk. And uh, uh, good luck, guys. And, and I, I wish you guys only, only the best. I, I truly mean that in uh, 2018. Hey, Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch, my good buddy, he's uh, re-signed with, Richard, with Stuart Haas Racing, um, which is a good thing. Uh, Stuart Haas Racing and Kurt Busch, uh, Kurt Busch will be driving the f number 41 as he has uh, over the years for Stuart Haas Racing. There was a lot of talk that he was not going to come back. He was going to be without a ride and things weren't going to be good for for him as you know this is a tough business and he's not a young kid but he he re-signed with Stuart Haas racing and at first this was just a report from Adam Stern of Sports Business Journal and uh, then motorsports.com confirmed it NBCSports.com confirmed it so so this is this is happening and Kurt Busch is one of those guys. I had the opportunity to have an adult beverage at, uh, at some place in Martinsville, Virginia. Actually, it was in Ridgeway, Virginia. And uh, there we are that day. And, and I, I can remember saying, uh, I said, oh, maybe I'll go have a beer with the guy. Goes, He's not going to want it. He's a big guy. He and he was like, you know, it was OK. We had a good time. Um, and, and you talk racing. And he's just like you and me. Well, maybe just not like you and me. But he's, a, you know, all of these race car drivers, except for the young ones coming up, uh, they're regular people. They'll have a conversation with you. They'll talk to you. They'll sign anything you bring to them. But, you know, one of the things that I've always said, you know, you, you see a guy sitting in a restaurant somewhere. You're at the local race, you know, in the, in the top echelon. Now, they're going to go eat somewhere. These guys go out. Don't get me wrong. And they're sitting there with their family. And, and this is just something a little idea for you guys. Don't go up and bother them to sign. Wait till they're done, they're leaving, you know. Interrupt your meal for them, <laughs> not their meal for you. Just one of those things. But uh, it's good to see that uh, Kurt Busch is back with Stuart Haas racing for, for the 2018 season. Anyway, we're going to come back, we're going to take a break, and we're going to talk about uh, a little embezzlement deal that went on to keep his son uh, racing, and uh, some other chat when we come back. Hey guys, this is Jibs from Ocean's 8 Alaska and you're watching In Radio TV Network. Hey, I'm, I'm Raul Panther. And I'm Commander B. Hawkins. And I'm Mark Will. We're uh, some of the proto men. If we see you without this bracelet, then you're punching the d But if you have this bracelet from InRadio.com, you can win 100 bucks. Put one of these on, or else.
What's up, guys? This is Assuming We Survive, and you're watching in Radio TV Network. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back. As everybody knows, whether you're in this sport as a driver, owner, or a fan, or even a promoter, racing is expensive. Very expensive. And I've seen guys not pay their electric bill so I didn't get a set of tires. I've seen guys not pay their mortgage because their motor came in and they had to pay for it. I've seen guys that had beautiful race cars, beautiful trucks at home, beautiful enclosed haulers, yet lived in a place that looked like it was the house that Jeb Clampett from the Beverly Hills moved from when he struck oil to go racing. Well, there's this kid that was driving for Kyle Busch Motorsports, Justin Boston. Justin was a young kid working his way up through the, all the series. And his dad, who wanted only the best for his kid, and I'm not making excuses, but he only wanted the best for his kid. And, and it, sometimes at these levels, you got to buy the ride. you got to come with sponsorship. So Robert Boston, Justin's dad of Hickory, North Carolina, he was convicted recently of crimes related to fraudulent theft of funds from his company's investors. He took this money and bought an expensive home so he could play the part, drove expensive cars, so he looked like he had money. And he financed his son's NASCAR truck career as a sponsor with this company called Zulo. I understand why the dad did this. You're out from Peter to pay Paul, and you hope that Paul pays you back. And there's no secret that Lawsuits between Boston and Kyle Busch Motorsports have been ongoing uh, for Boston, Robert Boston, failing to pay $650,000 in sponsorship money to Kyle Busch Motorsports to let his son continue to race. Again, I understand what he did. I understand the whys. We, I have children. I would do almost anything for my kids. But he stole from people who trusted him. He lived a lavish lifestyle from the outskirts, yet was struggling every day to find another nickel, another dime, another quarter to make sure that he had money to fund his son's racing. The shame of it was, is Justin Boston is a talented driver. To make it to the truck level, you had to be good somewhere. You had to have it so somebody looked and said, hey, wow, let's bring this guy in. And, and, and I know how some of these meetings go with these drivers and young kids. These meetings go something like, hey, would I like my kid to drive for you? Okay, what do you bring to the table? Because that's the first question I would ask if I was a car owner and, and did ask when I had people drive to me, what do you bring into the table? Bring something to the table that I don't have. And it might be money, it might be an engine, it might be the tire bill, it might be a shop, it might be a haul, it might be something, it might be sponsorship. You gotta bring something to the table. Long gone are the days where you got in by ability and the team made money because of that. So what they've done and what this man did is his son had talent and saw that he was being passed up by maybe some competitors that had less talent than him and realizes, hey, I got to do something. What he did was wrong. He was convicted. He could do a lot of time for this. And, and we're talking, you know, you're talking big time, federal time. You know, and I joke around with, you know, with people, you know, you know, 15 to 20. He's going to do this at stand, you know, like he, his life's over. And, and what he did to his family, his other family members, to make this happen, you know, it's wow. 
And, and when I read this, I was like, I was first like, are you kidding me? He, you know, let's say I was in a partnership with this guy and, and, and I'm struggling to get by and this guy's living in, in a mansion and driving, you know, $100,000 cars and, and his son's racing a, a, in the Camper World Truck Series and, and spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to go race him. My other question with this whole thing is, where were the bean counters? Where's the check and balance here? Where was their business manager for this company? Where was their accountant? Where were the tax people when this guy's spending millions and he's only making like 30,000 and lives in a multi-million dollar house down south, drives six-figure cars? Where were these people? The checks and balances in business didn't go well. And what this does with this sponsorship deal it leaves a bad taste in teams out. So think about it, I'm a car owner. And you come to me and say, all right, I'm gonna give you, you know, twenty-six million dollars and I'm gonna pay six and a half million now, six and a half million then, and so forth and so on, and you default on a payment. As a car owner, I'm spending money and budgeting based on that. So it's just sad that when I see something, and I'm sure this isn't the only story. This isn't the only father who did this so his son could go racing. Uh, and, and I look, even on the modified tour, I, I look at some of the, the people, and I don't begrudge anybody for going out and, and having a good time and making it happen. But I'm sure there's other people, and not only just on the touring series, but weekly, who take every dime they have to go racing. Now, we all know you don't make money racing. You, you don't. And, and those who say they do, uh, they're, they're not. <laughs> Let's just face it. You know, think about it. Even at the, the, the highest level, what it costs you to run, pay your team, travel, insurance, the shop, the equipment, the hauler, the cars, the motors, the rears, the trannies, you know, you're paying your people. Where does that all come from? It's got to come from somewhere. And you know, you, so you go, you have a, a tour modified, and you won $5,000. You spent that in tires. You spent that in hotels. You spent that in salaries. So some of the tour teams have full-time crew chiefs. And some of the tour teams have people on the payroll. And, and a lot of these people on the payroll think, all right, you know what? I'm with a touring series team. Whoopee, I'm gonna move up the ranks and I'm gonna make more money, make more money. You know, nobody's gonna pull you along. You gotta go and do it yourself, like Freddie Kraft did. He took everything he had, drew it in a bag, went to North Carolina. It paid off. It took eight years, but it paid off. You know, it's one of those things. And like I said, I, I've, I've seen tour people come in and go, and I, and, and I was talking to a, a modified tour owner a few years back and he, his driver moved on and it was, and it was a top rated team. And I'm not gonna give out any names and numbers, but I, I said to this gentleman, I said, gentlemen, who's gonna drive your car next year? And he goes, ah, you know, talking to a few people. I said, well, what about this guy? No, what do you mean no, he, the guy does good. He doesn't have any money. I says, oh. I said, so he has to come to the team. And he said to me, he goes, he's gotta cover the motor tires, something. I, I, I can't foot this bill myself. It, it costs over $100,000 to run 15 races on the modified tour. And, and that's if nothing breaks. We don't blow a motor, we, won't, we don't kink a frame, we don't trash a race car. That's just to load it up, open a day, and go. And go to the races. And I was like, wow. So there was a, a lot of talented drivers that I thought should have drove this race car. And then when the person who showed up and, and ended up driving it the following season, I'm finding out that his, his father wrote a, a real big check and had one of his companies put on the car and, and all that kind of good stuff. And when I say a big check, it, was, it wasn't 50,000, it wasn't 100,000. This check was for t over $200,000. Yeah, they did well, 
But was it worth two hundred thousand dollars? I, I don't know. I, I don't. I have a whole different feeling on 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 how racing should be. I, I was the type of guy. I, I always raced on sponsorship money. I always had a good time. I didn't win championships. I didn't win races. But at the end of most nights, I had a good time. Met some good people. Met some good friends. It was all good. Anyway, uh, I hope this works out for Mr. Boss, but he's going to see some time. Before I wrap up, we talked last week about the modified tour schedule for the Whale and Modified Tour. Um, my question, I'm going to throw that out there to the people. Where's Martinsville, down in Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, Spencer Speedway, upstate New York, Lime Rock Road Course, and if you're going to do Lime Rock, you might as well do Watkins Glen, New London Waterford Speed Bowl, they can get a one event sanction to race there. Lee, USA Speedway in New Hampshire, what happened, why are we not going there as a tour? And uh, the Walt Township Speedway in New Jersey, Modified's put in an awesome show there. Why are they not there? I don't know. Anyway. It's about it for tonight. We're going to wrap up. So uh, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedules to watch our show tonight. And for those of you who watch during the week, I know there's a lot of you that do that. It's you gone what lunch at work or, or you're on your computer at work. I want to thank you as well for the people who uh, offer their insights to me and things we should talk about. Don't forget, if you want your driver to appear on Where Are They Now, well, just let me know. We'll make it happen. Uh, so wherever your endeavors bring you this week, please be safe. Please be careful. Give somebody a hug. Tell them you love them. God bless you all, and we will see everybody next week. Good night, everybody. Hey, Ravy.